Hey y'all and uh, welcome back to part two of my reflection on working on the production for Lizzo's Watch Out for the Big Girls on Amazon Prime. First of all, I just want to say y'all really made me feel seen in this experience of sharing with you the amount of viewership that we've had over the last week has been really inspiring and definitely brought me back to a place of reflection around just why this is even important to share. And I will say right now, I don't feel like vindicated in any way. I don't feel like necessarily strong about sharing these pieces of our collective story and my own story with the production. I feel quite sad, honestly. I think there was a lot to be looked forward to with this experience in total. Again, this could have been really monumental for everyone that was a part of the cast, crew, production, etc. And unfortunately, I feel like that opportunity in a lot of ways was dwindled away. And I'm sad and even more so to know the experience that the girls are having in litigation and in trying to get some level of accountability around the experiences that happen while working with Lizzo. When we last left off, I was sharing with you all that the final rounds of the casting had been taking place. I had said to my husband, I was like, look, Unless Lizzo literally calls me by name herself, like I'm just not doing it anymore. Like I'm not chasing this. I'm not chasing after whatever this dream is. I'm not chasing after these auditions or these casting. I'm like, I'm just not doing it. You know what I mean? Four years of believing that maybe it would be possible to do some work with this iconic artist. And then finally, I don't know, like the dream just fizzled out after a while. So I was just like, look, I would love to do this. I think this is a beautiful project, but sis is going to have to literally say my name herself before I walk in that room. And for whatever reason, God actually brought that back to me. And she said my name when they brought her the final pitch. And that was my sign that this was okay to move forward with and then also with the show I feel like it's like it's been it's now almost summer and I've been sharing back and forth various ideations for episodes for the show what those episodes could look like how my work would be integrated into those episodes specifically so when you all go back and watch my pitch that I shared you'll see that just before part one um you'll see the elements of the show that I wanted to incorporate one, especially coming from a holistic perspective around how do we actually introduce the world to plus size dancers without creating this like jarring sense of instability, right? Like again, who supports them in that space? Like how are we actually like talking about the way this content rolls out, the way in which the girls are feeling protected, how does the crew actually take care of them as they're engaging in this work. Those are some of the things that I really wanted to see um, integrated into the fabric of the show long term and also something that I was really interested in taking on as work post show so if they were going on tour if they were going to be doing performances outside of that I wanted to have an opportunity to be considered for one of those roles in terms of supporting them and making sure that they had the environment the tools the language the safety and the ways that we're able to create it available to them so that it's not just like we already know 
the way in which fat bodies and larger bodies are regarded in the public. And unless you find that beautiful corner of the internet where we are celebrating our bodies, you're very likely to be left to some really insidious commentary about large bodies. And knowing that is the environment that these bodies are even coming from, knowing that this is the environment that these bodies have even been fighting against just to make it to the point in their artistic careers where they could be considered for something of this magnitude to reach this many millions of people worldwide. That's a major fight. And from a diversity equity and inclusion standpoint, or as y'all are saying now, belonging, equity and inclusion. How do you actually make space for these different identities that you're bringing into the work? And by making space for them, that means you are also figuring out what tools, processes, boundaries, conversations, education, or whatever needs to be in the space in order to actually protect those people that are doing labor on your institution's behalf. And if we don't have a way to actually provide care for those various identities, then at the root of it, that has to go back to exploitation. Because if you don't care about how you regard me, but you care about the work that I'm able to do, you care about the labor that I'm able to provide, that inherently is a disconnect. You can't value what I'm able to give and not value me. And what I see with this trend of wanting to create fat positive content and especially creating it in this reality now in this day is that if you're going to do the work on the external do it on the internal too with the team right your team has to know how to talk to people your team has to know what questions to ask, what questions not to ask. Your team has to know how to actually talk about the work. And we're going to get to that later. But that was something that was really critical to me in like the way in which the, the show was formed. And at some point, I got to jump around just a little bit. But so at a point during, so they're finalizing the casting. I was working with an agent that I had actually just signed with maybe a year or so before that. It was like right after Sex is a God thing premiered at the Black Harvest Film Festival. And so we were really starting to get some beautiful traction around that work. And I was like, oh, wow, like I found an agent, etc. I wanted to bring this deal to her and see what her thoughts were. And when I went into the conversation, they told me kind of some of the things to look for. They're going to get you a deal memo. They're going to do this. They're going to do that. And I said, okay. I said, I think I'd also like to work with an attorney because I just want to make sure that considering all of the points of connection around the work, knowing what my influence has been with this specific audience of people, I really want to make sure that I'm, I'm compensated for the work that I'm doing and in a way that I'm going to walk away from this, like not feeling, man, gave everything away for nothing. And I remember when we got to the second portion of the conversation, so there must have been like a call back maybe a couple days later or something with more details. And my agent at the time was basically like, before you go saying that you need to make more money than everybody else, And I was just like, wow, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't, I couldn't believe that was what she heard. And more than anything, I couldn't believe that was actually what she said and that chose to say in that moment. Instead of maybe, can you give me a little more clarity about what you're looking to make? How can we support asking for that amount of money? 
You know what I mean? As you're going into a deal, how can we support asking for that type of credit on the project? And I shared with them about some of the different connecting points, the work that I've been doing, how these these worlds overlap and intersect in a lot of ways, and how I had been contributing to the essentially development of the show prior to getting like its final formation. And there wasn't, you know, there wasn't a contract within that space of sharing these ideas back and forth, but there was the understanding that a role was going to be available, whatever that role would be. Now that could have changed at the last minute. So there was a lot of faith extended, but something just kept propelling me forward to say, I can commit to this. I can show up for this. I don't have to get small. I can allow myself to stand in the bigness of what this is. And I talked to an attorney after I had that conversation with my agent at the time and decided that I needed to let go of my talent agent because there wasn't going to be a way to explain my value in a way that she would understand and actually advocate for me for that. And so my attorney and my legal team really went to bat and requested the things that I actually wanted to see requested and had the audacity to actually ask for those things on my behalf. And that felt really good, even though we got a no on some of the things it felt really good that we even had the audacity to ask and that I had that level of support to be advocated for in that way. And so what we ended up coming out of the initial agreement was that so it was like two separate contracts. I'd be on camera talent. So then an employee of the production. And then I'd also be a consultant and provide their production training prior to the start of filming. So I was like, it's not everything. (laughs) I was really hoping that they would even consider a junior producer credit. And I don't even know if that's like the right language for it. But in my mind, it's an acknowledgement of an artist within the industry as an up and coming, as a not, what do you call it? Not an intern, but some somewhat of a an apprentice, so to speak, right? Someone who's learning the ropes, but they've contributed a significant amount of time, energy, resource, thought leadership, etc., or even physical labor, and you want to acknowledge that in some another way. And I know that there's all of this red tape around what do producer credits mean and how does that break down either financially or within just like the system itself. And I still think that there is space to be able to acknowledge people as up and coming producers, even if that's not attached to some type of monetary gain in that moment. But perhaps it can be a model, like a possibility model for the way in which we can bring equity into how these shows and experiences and and story labs are built. And I really would love to see SAG after come to some sort of relationship with reality TV because as y'all can see from you could just YouTube it you know what I'm saying you can see all of the things that the complaints that are happening from different entertainers um across various reality TV networks and I think it's just time to unionize and that's a conversation for a whole nother day so I think that some of these things that are happening around lack of credit or not appropriate credit or some of the boundaries that may be a little bit fuzzy would really just clean right up with some more union support and for me I had actually just solidified my membership as a SAC after a member and I'd been Taff Hartley for a number of years. I actually right out of college landed a couple national voiceover commercials like 
back to back and I was like oh my god this is amazing it's amazing it's amazing and then got to I don't know if you all remember the company Ambi but it was like a skincare line for black women and I had booked a national radio spot with them but I had to pay $1,500 in dues the next day or I was gonna lose the audition. And I had to pay those dues because the audition, the auditions that I had booked just before that essentially pushed me over the limit to be what is considered Taft Hartley is a must join of the union. So you've booked enough gigs, you've made X amount of dollars, now you have to be a part of the union. Or you can choose to not be in the union, not take union jobs, and then lose gigs. <laughs> And so it took me moving out to the West Coast and doing some digging to actually find out that there are equity programs within each local chapter, especially for people who are experiencing significant financial hardship. And at the time we were recently moved, I was caregiving for my mom, a number of things, and we were going into the middle of a pandemic. I found that local chapter and they really were like, yeah, let's get you in here and get you solidified, reduce the cost of my, the cost of my initiation fees and made me an official member. And that was a huge moment of success for me as an actor especially, like I said, having had that experience just right out of college where I was like, yes, I'm like finally getting some work. I'm like, I can finally understand like how I'm going to make it in this industry. And it's bam, try something else. <laughs> so it took a minute to get there, but I was grateful to have it. And also it was very useful in negotiations around my pay rate. And that's something that I really encourage you all. If you're working with a production, yes, you can have an agent, but you can also have an attorney do your dealings for you as well. And they're gonna be there's gonna be a fee to navigate with an attorney, but it's gonna be worth it because you'll also have somebody who can go to bat for you in a way that sometimes your agent may not be able to because of how close and network the people that they're talking to are to them, right? So they're also trying to manage relationships with people and not seem too demanding and not seem overzealous. And they've got all of these different things that they're thinking about. And you can also have a legal team that will you raise the questions that you actually want to have. And I find that to be really critical um, in this entire experience. <clears throat> we get down to what was our final uh, process. Like I said, I'll be doing on-camera talent work and then working as a consultant, providing their set safety training and set safety and inclusion training. This is a practice marked through the Messy Movement Lab. And it's the beginning of a series of training around body safety, set safety, and inclusion specifically dealing with plus size and larger body dancers. It's something that I'm really proud of. I feel like this is work that has been so close to my heart for a long time and something that I really pray that in my lifetime, I actually see come to fruition just this idea of seeing positive images of larger body people in various capacities of entertainment. Being able to provide that training was really a great experience. And I have to say, the crew that they pulled together, I've never met just such an open hearted group of folks the responses that I got from the crew after filming brought me to tears. And after filming and after hosting the, the actual training itself, and that was a really that was a really nice welcome home experience. And I'm really grateful for the people that they did bring into the space to do this type of work. Something that I noted, though, was that like Lizzo, her choreographers and in some other important members of the crew from a above the line position were not at the set safety training. And so I do wonder how 
the experiences thereafter would have been impacted had there actually been an intentional moment for everyone, not just the people who are like being paid hourly staff and all of that, like everyone, no one is an exception to understanding how we're going to regard this space. I do wonder how that would have changed things had they actually participated. And with that participation, what other conversations may have been able to come forward, even just from the space of being able to hold each other accountable in the agreements that we make around how we're going to show up here. So that was something that I found to be really interesting. And so then like a couple weeks go by and um, we're getting ready to head out. My attorneys, she's, you know, moving back and forth. They're getting everything together. They've sent over a red line and they're, we're waiting on, I'm sorry, we're waiting on Bunham and Murray and Amazon to send over their red line revision of what we've sent and I'm already on the plane to LA and the night before filming I'm talking to the line producer at Bonham and Murray and I'm like hey you all are sending me over the contract today and I'll have to have my attorneys review the contract before I sign it and there was pressure from this line producer for me to just go ahead and sign it. And she was expressing a lot of frustration to me via text about how this should have already been done. And I just need to sign it and they'll, we can figure things out afterwards. And I was like, no, because, and I'm so glad that I really had the presence of mind to say no. And it created a, a moment. I don't fully know everything that came behind it, but I can tell you a few things that I did see that ultimately changed that day. So the next morning, woke up, I'm on the phone with two of my best friends and my mom and my husband's in the hotel room with me. And I'm like, look, am I going to have to walk away from this? Because they're trying to say that I have to sign this contract before I come to set. And I just... I'm reading through the contract and I know that there are things in here that I don't agree with. Even before I can have our legal team take a look at it, I know that there's things in here that I don't agree with about the way about my image and how that cannot be disruptive outside of the production. All these like very like little nicks and crannies that I was just like, mm, I don't know. I feel like this is being washed over. And so, of course, I started getting down to time and they were like, you have to do what you feel like is best. And it is OK, because we I think just as a family, we just have a philosophy of this or something better. And so we figured out an agreement. They were able to understand that contract would be signed once my attorneys had a chance to look over it. And we went ahead with filming and that day I got to set I could tell that Lizzo was either already there or had was would be there shortly Every, everybody was spread out we've got the dressing room down here first of all we're in like the Beverly Hills area you've got this huge beautiful estate unfortunately not accessible from a disability standpoint in a lot of ways and as many of you all saw, I began using a cane that year walking into that production. And it was something that I, I wasn't sure if I was going to allow myself to be vulnerable and just have the support aid that I needed in the space. What I know now as an, an autoimmune disorder then was just presenting itself as essentially not being able to walk. <laughs> at various times and my legs not being stable underneath me and I'd injured my knee on top of that so I was having a multitude of experiences with my physical capacity but I knew that I would still be able to teach 
So I grabbed my mom's cane and I took that with me for just like spiritual grounding and emotional support. And I was just like, I'm not going to try to hide this. You know what I mean? Like I'm just as worthy of this experience and this visibility with my cane as I would be without it. And but getting to set one, not being able to have any support with my bags, just like my setup, my normal class setup. And you all know me and Miller, we roll as a team. He has been with me from start to finish on, I don't know how many tour dates, workshops, retreat setups, y'all know. So y'all know everything that goes into me setting up a space and it being grounded in the way in which it needs to be grounded. Just trying to bring different support tools with me so that I can stretch, so that I can feel sturdy as I'm in the space teaching all these different things. And it was just a mess trying to get into the little sprinter van. I've got all this crap walking with a cane then I've got to walk down like a hill that's 10 feet and then 50 steps I was like oh my god (laughs) this could not literally be any fucking worse so basically once I got down to the studio which was like down another 10 steps I just stayed down there I didn't even I don't even think I came back out until after we had finished filming and so it was just a lot of reckoning like and not being able to have that support and then the space also not being accessible for anyone that might have had any type of disability or physical condition like that would prevent them from being able to walk up and down hills like it just wasn't it just and then when you're dealing with people who are larger body plus size like these are things that I feel like also should be taken into consideration not from the perspective of like our bodies are weaker but it's just it's just a no oh like maybe it would be more helpful or more conducive to the space if we were in a space that didn't have so much terrain so to speak small things matter ah yes (laughs) so upon getting to set i get an update that elimination has been added as a feature of the show. And I was like, really taken aback. I'm about to film and you all are sharing with me that essentially the baseline of the show has changed because when it was originally brought to me, The idea or the feeling and the concept around the show was to be a dance show without elimination, right? You're learning, you're growing together as a team, you know what I mean? Some people may get used for certain performances, maybe other people still train, maybe they all switch off. There's a lot of ways that model could have been utilized, especially when what we see afterwards is that a majority of the girls went on to perform with her in other places whether that was on tour or other concerts or other appearances or what have you you know what I mean so it it has still the same concept but what we're seeing is like this idea of people being terminated from the group and all that jazz and so I really fell in love with this idea of not making it competition based in that capacity when they first brought the show to me and I felt like, wow, like this could be really holistic. This could be really powerful. One to just see plus size dancers just training and moving and learning choreography and just dealing with their own emotional inner turmoil and conflict and success and all of these things. And then rising to the occasion to stand behind this fucking mega superstar who is like blowing the world away right? You can ask anybody, y'all. From now until forever, I believe that Lizzo is one of the most iconic singers of our time. I believe that she's talented. I believe she's raw. And I also believe that she's a bit misled. Because you can't have this many accounts of people saying that there's been harm done And there's nobody right. 
And as I was sharing with someone who messaged me on Instagram after listening to part one, I said, I want Lizzo to know that all of these stories are an opportunity to reflect and change course. And also, we can call these behaviors out and not throw you away. We don't have to discard a few just because we're saying, yo, you fucked up. And who would we be if we looked at your behavior and did not say anything to you? Who will we really be? And this is not the first time that I'm speaking about these things. And that these have also been private conversations that have been shared with you. But these have, if there's been avoidance. So I learned that this elimination feature has been added. I'm trying to get ready for the class. I bring my own outfits. I'm dripped down in lingerie from the temptress boudoir. And I'm just trying to get in my element and get ready to take on whatever this experience is. And I'm here. I'm, I'm also like fucking losing my shit. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm here. Like I'm literally, I'm coming on TV to be myself. And that feels really powerful. You know what I mean? That feels really substantial that the work that I've done with the Messy Movement Lab, the work that I've done around central movement and somatic healing, that that work has become visible enough that we could be here. And that means a lot, right? I'm getting ready. I'm setting up my altar. I'm dripped down in that Afro Mystic 8th House oil. Y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> And I'm just trying to bless the space like just be as open as possible. And so one of the production assistants or someone from the crew came in and was like, as I had already lined up all of the mats and got all my flowers and everything and their journals and everything already laid out. And y'all know when I come, when you come to class, like I just, I love to have it set up a particular way. And usually I'm either dead in the center of the class and we sit in a huge circle or I stand at the front and then I have everyone one line back and they're in on their mats. And so one of the PAs came in and sat her, put another yoga mat next to me in the position where the teacher would be. And I was like, oh no, this spot is for me as the teacher. If she wants to join class, she'll have to sit with the girls. And they were like, what? Is there, was there a different expectation? Because if there was, nobody explained that to me because certainly how you gonna sit at the front of a class you ain't never been to? And how you gonna sit at the front of a class where you really don't even know what's about to happen. Like, you don't know what's going to happen for you somatically. You don't know what's going to happen for you emotionally. And are you really in a place to be at the front of the class? I'm trying to give you a little bit of a privacy and ambivalence. They don't have to keep, they don't have to catch you on the camera every time. But if you sit smack dead in the front, that doesn't really make sense. And also, y'all brought me here to teach. So, what's up? So, anyway, I didn't say all of that, y'all. <laughs> all that to the people i was just like oh no we can have her sit here or in this spot if she'd like to join us for the class you know what i'm saying again i i'm i don't know i have no idea what to expect i also have been on set at this point for maybe three hours and i have not seen her at all we get ready to start the class and I realized that they've taken her mat away completely. She doesn't join the class or the filming of the experience or anything, but the experience of working with the dancers was life-changing. The energy felt in that room and just being able to affirm that 
You know what I'm saying? That they are doing some powerful work and work that will have a ripple effect for many years to come. I will never forget that. And I'll never forget being able to have that particular space. And I was so grateful because the crew did such a beautiful job decorating the dance studio. And like they even let me like pick out my lighting and you know what I mean? Have my vibe that we like to have in class. And so y'all see the lights. <laughs> Y'all see the lights in the episode. Like that's that's my favorite place to be. And um being able to share that with them was really magical. And so after the class, they get get me to the little sprinter van and head me back down to my hotel. Now mind you, I'm not even trying to be petty, y'all. But it just adds to this conversation around like distance, creating some distance or some avoidance in some ways because I'd done the set safety training at this point and their legal team was in there asking questions about how to support this or that you know what I'm saying this was a a real live training to prepare them for the start of production and originally I was supposed to be hosted in it was like a four and a half or four star hotel up in the hills, but somehow ended up in a completely different hotel, you know, at the bottom of the hills, you know, off the expressway, not a terrible hotel, but not the hotel that they originally, you know, said that they would be hosting me at. And also the place where they kept the rest of the other staff and above the line crew. And so I found that to be really interesting. And it was, and when I mentioned it to the line producer, she skated around it, but I, I knew that there was something off there. Something had changed at the last minute. You know what I mean? Um, so anyway, I get back to the hotel. I'm trying to recap the entire day with my husband and I send Lizzo a message. And I'm like, hey, thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm really grateful to have had a chance to work with the girls. And she replied back. She replied back, but it was just like, you really helped the girls. And I'm just starting to get settled and wind down from the day. It's been a long day. My body is done, okay? And I see all over the news are these articles of... Her, her being Lizzo, <laughs> having what seems to be like a full-on meltdown before she's in hair and makeup on set. And I just was like, huh? Like, when did this happen? I'm like, how was I the person that was on set at the time and you all didn't think to say, hey, can you just take a few minutes with her? Like just even from a somatic healing standpoint, forget the show, but somehow that became the focal point of the day. And again, I told you all that like after they, I guess they originally was going to have her as part of the class. And then with whatever changes and stuff were being made in the space, that just got nixed and they were, that was it. And then literally was on set all day, never saw her. She never once came out to interact <laughs> or engage or anything of the sort. And so it was just a really strange dynamic, you know what I'm saying, to have the influence and what not to be called to the show but then also to be isolated from certain people that are a part of the show this is a for it to have been while it is a major production it was a very small crew and we were in one house like we were on one property we weren't like in five different locations and somebody in a trailer and somebody no somebody was in a house that was part of the property and some, we was in another part that they had built on in the yard. Like, one property, y'all. We in close proximity, but you never come out to speak. You never come out to have face-to-face -face interaction. You never come out to take class. Like, so anyway. 
So after filming ends, should we just go back to normal life? I came home and really had a major caregiver crisis on my hands in terms of my mom's care and life just went back to normal and we heard nothing nothing i maybe got an email asking me for some footage but outside of that there wasn't a lot of communication around when they were going to start promoting the show when it was releasing what we needed to be aware of or a part of so that we could support with the upliftment of the show nothing and of course i'm just like oh man like this is the really rough part and unimaginable that they wouldn't reach out to actually share more details like the production itself and that they wouldn't want us to be a part of promoting the show, especially because you're using our faces, you're using our names, and you're using that to sell the show. That just seems like a win. <laughs> like, why wouldn't we be included in that particular process? And so I saw that the the girls got down to South by Southwest, and I was like, wow, man, it would have been so cool to be a part of that especially because there was only two other teachers on the show outside of the main choreographer and so it wasn't like it was like 15 different people that you needed to invite it was just two it was just two on this very small team of larger body dancers fat black women fat black and brown women like who are really breaking into the industry so again another one of those points of creating a sense of equity and belonging and also opening the door right is not just exploiting someone's image for what it can do for you one not exploiting an image at all but being in collaboration with people truly right allowing people an opportunity to also grow within the work that is being developed and having an opportunity to do press, having an opportunity to even just be a part of the audience for the South by Southwest experience, being on the panel, being able to speak to more of the social justice aspect around why the show was important. I really feel like they could have used the rest of the cast, you know what I'm saying, in order to do that work, especially with this being such a groundbreaking and innovative show and storyline and I had a dream one night and I was like oh I woke up the next day like something told me that I like need to get prepared for all of the Lizzo stuff and I wrote an article about not dying in the disappointment and that article came out two days before they released the first press release for the show. So I'm finding out with the rest of the world how this is about to go down because outside of that one interaction, I've literally heard nothing. And so I'm waking up to my name in every news article source that I've known as like important and fabulous and whatever talking about this show and I'm just like whoa taken aback wow my name as a movement as expert is literally in all of these papers but what still wasn't ringing a bell for me is like why use my name and parallel to my influence, but then remove me from the places where I can actually have impact in spreading the message or in being of support to the work. And in my mind, if I'm important enough to be listed in the newspapers, I was probably should have been doing press as well in some form or fashion. And I think it's absolutely asinine that my co-castmate, who's also a teacher on the show, 
did not get listed in the articles. And so it felt like this kind of weird <laughs> separation of the actual meat of the production, if that makes sense. And so, oh my God, so many things are happening. There's so much, all this press is coming out back to back to back to back. And I'm watching Good Morning America and she's doing an interview about the show. And one of the uh, images that they used was actually from my class. And so you don't see me, you just see me walking through the space. What you know to be like my signature space creation. And then you hear her say, using uh, a quote that... I shared in my 2018 article that we're not your punchline and you all have to go check that out. I'll link that article in the comments, but that article is called fat black women and films deserve humanity in TV and film. And we are not your punchline for your art. You have to check that out. So I'm just like, man, I'm like, <laughs> All right, I'm training the crew, expert on the show, being acknowledged in all of this press. You're, they've pulled this clip and you're now using language that is inherent to the work that I've been doing. Like I've, when I say y'all that it's not a one-time thing and you can look at the article yourself. The article was originally written in 2018 and then it's been updated maybe every two years since then. It's time for an update now because I think the last one was in 2022. And But you'll see in that article that we talk about, that I talk about the number of ways in which just fat black bodies are used as the punchline and never seen as anything outside of this idea of being like, the supporting role or the supporting character or the fat funny character or the, the comic relief or the butt of the joke. And with our work with Sex is a God thing, we're really wanting to challenge how do we bring three-dimensional characters that are plus size, dark skinned women to the forefront? How do we prioritize more stories that actually have diverse bodies? How do we get out of this making larger body people the fat bestie? Because we're way more than that, right? And that work went viral in 2020. That article went viral in 2020 on Facebook and Instagram and maybe I believe on Twitter as well. So I know that, again, this isn't a space where this is someone that hasn't had connection to my work, that doesn't know the work that I do, obviously. And so it just starts, I feel like I'm just starting to be gaslit. This isn't really happening, but it's happening. And so then you start questioning yourself and I'm like, am I being too petty? And I'm like, no, but like, those are like literally your words verbatim. And it's also the visual of your class. And it's also someone that you worked with directly. And also, and also. And so I'm just like, whoa, you know what I'm saying? Going back to the producer credit thing, you know, just even the acknowledgement of my work as a consultant visibly in the credits would have really given a little more spaciousness around what feels like the use of my intellectual property, right? What feels like stepping into this space of, I'm just going to take this because what are you going to do about it? When it's like, clearly there's been impact, clearly there's been influence, but for whatever reason, there's this need to erase me from the story, but use my influence by proxy and use the, and tap an audience. So you say my name and then people, okay, she does sensual movement. She does empowerment work. She does self-love work. She does somatic healing. She's, she's a movement expert and she specifically focuses on people with larger bodies coming back to the body. People who've experienced trauma coming back to the body. You know this about the work. So you're attempting to build trust with an audience based off of a familiar name. 
And again, that really falls under the realm of exploitation, especially when there's no intentional collaboration with me or whomever that person could be in that same spot to be able to actually have real conversations about why this work matters to that particular community, how we want to edify and uplift this community in the show and external. In small and large ways, there's room. But the thing is, when you try to throw quick money at something to make a quick dollar, to make a quick award, to you know what I'm saying? You're not thinking about all of the people that you're stepping on and that you're harming and that you're throwing to the side just to get to the goal. But then what do you have left at the end? What's available for you at the end? Who is available to you at the end? That's not somebody that's just there to catch whatever crumbs they can. So, you know, the show release was a mix of emotions, powerful excitement craziness, disappointment, feeling isolated, feeling just disconnected, but also, oh my God, I can't believe this thing just happened. (laughs) Got a chance to connect with some folks within the cast and crew and part of naturally the work that we bring into the space you know, comes with follow-up. <laughs> and that was one of the things that I really tried to offer for them in creating this space and really trying to be intentional about the way that we're regarding and caring for these bodies in particular as they do this particular work was one, give the dancers an opportunity to have this experience together, maybe virtually before they have to do this type of liberatory work on camera, right? It's not going to change anything about how dynamic the what will be captured on camera will be, but it does give them an opportunity to like not have to experience it for the first time in that particular way. If we're really talking about this from a holistic perspective, like we can give them an opportunity. Maybe that's content that's shared later down the road or something like that. But what would it look like for them to actually be able to engage with this first and really find a sense of safety in it and then be able to step into it again to be on camera? And so naturally, a part of the work, and and then that comes with also being able to have some integration work afterwards, like processing what just happened for you. How are you feeling in your body? How do you maybe need to support yourself? What adjustments does you need to make going forward in your movement? Or what things do you maybe need to consider in terms of like how you're caring for yourself? And just being able to have some of that emotional strategy and guidance would be really beneficial, especially after doing such visceral somatic work. And within that, I did not actually know that there was going to be another teacher on the show. They didn't share that information or make it available so that we could like both benefit off of it, sharing each other's content or getting a chance to do like a panel together again or doing some press together for the show because we both have our own respective audiences that have a far and wide reach. And there would have been a a lot of, of just fruit, just plenty of fruit to bloom from that particular collaboration in that space. But for whatever reason, they did not let us know. They also put one of us in the papers and not the other. And then came to one class, but then not the other. And so it's just a really, again, this creation of chaotic environments, lack of clarity, lack of certainty, creating avoidance where there should be presence definitely adds to 
an unstable power dynamic. And everybody in the room is, I'm so grateful to have this opportunity and doesn't want to get fired. You know what I mean? Nobody's going in there to try to blow up the spot and be like, you did this wrong. You did this wrong. You did that wrong. And why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? Nobody's thinking like that. People are genuinely going in open hearted, excited, like just ready, ready to take on whatever the experience has to bring. And then you're met with a wall. And then, but you're still like, there's no engagement, no a real relationship, but there's all of this extraction. There's all of this usage. There's all of this mining from in order to create more worlds, but then to move you out of it at the same time. Naturally, in doing harm reduction work, the extension of conversations came just to say, how is your heart? Like, how is the experience landing for you now that we're in this particular phase of the show, it being released, people receiving it, etc. And what came from that was some heavy heartedness about the avoidance that was in the space with leadership and that leadership starting with Lizzo and some of the other behavior that was happening on set that caught me off guard. Different expressions of intimidation to, again, creating avoidance in certain spaces where there were presence would really be necessary, creating some levels of, of fear around the dancers and like making derogatory remarks about people's presence, their bodies, etc. And I didn't know what to do with that information. I didn't know what to do. And I was like, oh my God, like this is, when this comes out, this is, this it'll be bad. You know what I mean? And this is not the experience that any of us signed up for. So we're sharing and holding space and just trying to, find a space to be able to talk about this thing that we don't necessarily feel like we can talk about in public because we're not trying to again make derogatory remarks about the show or cast a negative light on it or make it seem like it's just a, a shitty experience all around but it's there's there's specific Things or behaviors that are happening, they need to be addressed. And again, you can't, how do we have this many accounts and there's no sense of accountability? There's no sense of we need to redirect. And all of it comes down to just what really what feels like bullying behavior. And I don't fuck with bullies, y'all. It's just... It's not the vibe, you know what I mean? I grew up being bullied for a number of reasons and it just, we don't have to continue that energy as grown women. We don't have to continue those narratives. We don't have to keep playing out that same pain. We can heal from that. We can realize that there are safe people around us. We can overcome whatever the, the, the shitty is, but we got to be willing to get help. And we got to be willing to deal with the things that are coming up, especially when we call ourselves taking the forefront of some level of leadership or taking the forefront of some movement to be the face of some anything. We've got to go do our work, too. It's not to say you got to be perfect when you step out there, but you got to have your shit together in some type of way. You can't be out here stepping on people and not holding yourself accountable for where you're misstepping. You just can't. I'm getting word of this and I'm just like, look, I'm going to reach out to her directly and see if she would be willing to have a conversation with us. So on, what's it? July... Maybe July 1st. I can't see the date on this. July. 
we'll, we'll say July 1st of 2022. The show's already out. It's been a few months now at this point. And I reached out to her and I said, Hey you, I hope you're well. I'm reaching out to see if you might be open to having a Zoom conversation with myself and my other cast member. There were some experiences of harm that happened on set that we want to talk through. Instead of doing like we always have to do to survive in white, in white institutions, be silent and sweep it under the rug, I'm hoping we can come together to talk, be accountable, heal, and find solutions forward. We care deeply about you and this beautiful vision. We want nothing more than for us to all move forward on the same wavelength. If you have the capacity and interest in jumping on a 75-minute max Zoom call, please let me know. I can send over a booking link or you can give me a couple times that work best for you. So I end up reaching out again, letting her know that I'd be in the LA area. Maybe you would be willing to have the conversation, but maybe you would like to have it in person. I was even open to that. We hadn't had an opportunity to do any type of one-to-one -one sit down in that way. But again, having worked with the show and really wanting to make sure that there was a holistic experience from start to finish and support in creating that experience, I felt like it would be helpful to offer another pathway for us to have that conversation and maybe see if we could move forward. Then sent the message again, no response. I sent the message via email, also no response. And so at this point, we're just, what can we do? You know what I mean? And I think that we really gotten to the point where it was like, we have to find space to share our experience of what happened. And I think we definitely got there in our own individual timing. And in all honesty, I guess leaning on hope. Because at the end of the day, I keep asking God sometimes like, why this experience? For this to be the first experience that I'm having of being on TV and being able to bring my work into the world and wanting to also work with Lizzo for many years and why this experience and why this way? And I haven't gotten the answer to that question just yet. But I think it just really points back to just like the deep levels of sadness that I've experienced over the last couple of years in trying to process this whole journey. So here are my final thoughts, y'all. We're going to get on out of here, okay? Um, thank you all for listening. Thank you for being with me as I take an opportunity to just lighten my heart and um, make some space. i holding these stories and holding them so tight and holding the disappointment and holding the hope that something better comes along and that a different experience really allows for me to see that the, the work that we've put in is has been worth it. It's been a lot. And we can't hold these stories and all of this other stuff so tight and try to live and live a good life because it's just the stress just will take you out. So I hope that if for nothing, I hope that this inspires you to tell your own story and find ways to keep showing up for the thing that you believe in and keep showing up for the dream that you have. So I'm going to do a little rapid fire for these last few points. Things that I found to be interesting. When Amazon Prime's head of global diversity, Latasha Galepsi, posted about the show, 
her commentary was centered around the queer dynamic of the show and really and the curvy girls and i just thought it was really interesting that somehow the storyline for the show had changed once again and in the post on linkedin she was celebrating the director of the show and i thought wow a worthy acknowledgement right it just seemed like off because the show centers plus size dancers wanting to work with a plus size singer in this monumental <laughs> experience of bringing bodies to TV, these bodies to TV in, in like a positive light. And somehow all of that got lost. And suddenly the story was now different. And so I actually commented on this post and I was just like, you know, I, I think this is beautiful. And also we can acknowledge these producers for their lived experience and creation of bringing this show to life. And also following up from that, I reached out to Latasha Gillespie in a number of direct messages via social trying to explain that as a part of this show that is on the platform, understanding that she has a role in supporting the diversity, equity, and inclusion experiences that happen with the shows. And I wanted to bring some things to her attention about experiences of harm and distress that happen on set that need to be addressed. First message, she actually responded back and asked me for the best email contact to use so she could get in touch with me off outside of social, I assume. I responded back and she saw the message, didn't reply, and never received another email from her. And I sent another message or two, I believe two messages after that. And she saw the messages multiple times, but never responded. Another point being the Emmy Awards and another opportunity and moment where, one, there would have been an opportunity for access for myself and my co-castmate and an opportunity to flourish within an, an industry that we have historically been pushed out of. And again, it's not like there's 16, 50, 35 people left to invite. There were just two people left. Two people left, two people that poured labor and love into the girls, two people that influenced the direction of the show, two people that brought audiences to the show, two people that are also navigating the same systemic challenges as the dancers, but yet and still an opportunity where you could have us all together but you choose to make yourself the one and only. Some things that I thought that I just were, that gave me pause, like with the actual production itself, I really didn't like them dancing on the glass. I, I really, I didn't think that was a smart move at all. And I definitely, knowing the amount of time that they have to set these things up and film them and work all the pieces out. I just think that they really created a space where, you know, um, they put the bodies, the dancers' bodies at risk. And I often find that with plus size dancers, because people have such a hard time looking past our weight in movement, they oftentimes need us to go above and beyond in some really extreme way in order to like really show like athletic ability and skill and it's inherently fat phobic and I think that things like creating those type of environments in production in tv stage film wherever you're doing it just it's just unnecessary like fat bodies deserve to just exist and be able to be seen for the agility the skill the, the wisdom and talent that 
our bodies possess without having to do like something over extreme or over the top in order to prove that we are actually real dancers or in order to prove that we actually belong here. I do think that I was really grateful that they had our class and the Messy Movement Lab class prior to doing this new shoot because I do feel like I was super proud of Isabel's response and just like standing her ground around her beliefs and how she wants to regard her body and what that translates, how that translates for her culturally and all of these aspects. I was really proud that she had the uh, capacity to say no, especially given how high the stakes were. And I think that is something to be modeled and highly regarded in these spaces. I did suggest an intimacy coordinator to them prior to the beginning of filming, but they chose to not have an actual intimacy coordinator on set, which I believe would have mitigated any surprise mentions of nudity. At least that's my understanding of what our work is intended to do, right? Because surprising people with a nude shoot in the middle of filming is not appropriate. It's just not. People should have full knowledge, full understanding, full consent prior to even getting into the space. That's something that's going to be asked of them. And if they give you like a marker now, like for right now, I'm a yes. Now, if that changes afterwards, that's something different and they can change. But you at least have given them foreknowledge that before they even walk in the space, that's something that they're going to have to deal with. And so while it's said that it's not counted against you, if you decide not to, you can see that's not true, right? You can see that being fully engaged, being willing to take all of the risks, being able to do the extreme stuff is the thing that's going to be most valued in the space. And so it's creating these levels of intimidation around something that should be consensual, not something that should be like required without, without knowledge, just like on the spot. <clears throat> And so I really wish that they had given them the opportunity to consent to that prior to and then it not be a barrier. Maybe there's a group of girls that don't do the nudity shoots and maybe there's a group that, that are very comfortable with it, right? And they could have just done two different assignments. It didn't have to be, this is the thing, are you going to participate or no, right? Because inherently with the dynamic that you are like creating and now adding this step of elimination, you're creating a, a fearful environment. So people are not responding from a, a, a place of the nervous system being regulated. They're on this competition show. The stakes are high. It's a long ass fucking day. You're trying to make all of these decisions and you're like, do I want to be nude on this show for the rest of my life? Those are a lot of questions to have to answer in the moment. Yeah. The other thing was like, there's not an actual fat positive or body positive choreographer working with them for their stage performances. Y'all, and, and I really would have appreciated seeing them actually hire a plus size choreographer, not a former plus size person, not, not someone who just works with larger bodies, but actually a plus size choreographer. Someone who lives in that body, understands that body, and also has trained, conditioned, and gotten themselves to the point where they, like, they're in that space, like, they're living in that. Because I think there's a difference in the way that someone talks to you when they understand your lived experience. And as a dancer, and as a plus size dancer, that's just not an experience, one, that many students or even artists are even having. And again, having a choreographer in the space that isn't questioning some of the stereotypical traits that people question about larger body performers, like your stamina, your endurance, your commitment, 
That's a big one, right? Because really, i.e. your commitment to the work is really about your weight. Are you really committed to this? Because if you were, you'd be doing more to not have that weight on you so you could be better at this. And there's all, there's that undertone. And my larger body dancers, y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. And I'd love to hear your thoughts about the ways in which you've been regarded or treated in your dance spaces, right? There's just the difference in working with a plus size person who actually loves themselves and also loves to teach other people. It's a difference. We do not need to be the one and the only. Like collaboration over exploitation, collaboration over isolation, collaboration over avoidance. We don't need to be the one and the only. This is too much work to carry for us to try to be the one and the only face, the, the person that's got to be up there. Like, we can share the stage. We can stare, share the stage. Leadership and avoidance do not go together. And that's really a big one on my heart. If you're going to step up to stand for a mission or step up to rally for something, then you got to fully step up. You got to stand on business. You got to really commit. And that commitment looks like being fully all in on all sides, not dancing in and out when you feel like it. The fear that people have and being able to tell the truth about what's happening in these production experiences is dangerous. Dangerous. There needs to be a better process for people to speak about the harms that they've experienced, for them to get support, and for them to be able to have some sort of solution brought to the table. This fear is dangerous, and it's only going to get worse if we don't nip it in the bud. And my last point is, I stand with the dancers. I stand with the dancers in litigation. I have been hunting, really, in all honesty, for a space to talk about my own story. Like, I wanted to put it somewhere that mattered. I wanted it to not just be washed under the rug. I wanted wanted us to have that sense of, no, like, we... We got something back. Like we felt like we weren't really included and like we didn't really belong in the experience when it was released, but we got something back. Here we are. And I got into the point where I actually, I was um, a step away from speaking to a producer to do another pitch to talk about this reflection that I have of being on the show and I, and how that would support the girls and, and whatnot. And Well, I think it was a great offer to try to do that round of pitches and see who might pick up the story. I knew that I'd never be able to share all of it. You know what I'm saying? Like they'd never, they're not going to sit there and (laughs) give you all the detail. They're going to take what's most important to them and, and leave the rest. And I really wanted to be able to, for my own heart and for my own understanding, and peace to be able to just share with you all the weight of what has really been going on and why it's been so conflicting and so hard to talk about this thing, but also to be so proud of it and also to be sad that it's not going to be the same and that the opportunity to really make this something powerful has really been stripped in a way because of poor behavior and lack of accountability. And I'm looking at these institutions. I'm looking at Bunham and Murray. I'm looking at Amazon Prime Video. I'm looking and I I don't understand this idea of an institution working parallel to an organization and you're unwilling to acknowledge the harm 
that's happening within the experiences that you're creating. And that is being complicit with the behavior. You can't sit on the sidelines and still try to make money off of it. That's being complicit in the harm. I stand with the girls. And like I said earlier, there needs to be restitution for them. There needs to be accountability across the board. And we're not trying to throw you away.